Hi, Spring fans. Welcome to another installment of Spring Tips. You know, I love Java, and I love Java 21 in particular. Java 21 and later are amazing. Java 21 features a number of amazing things, and I think the headline feature, of course, is virtual threads, about which, by the by, we had a small video not too long ago. Go check that out. But there's other things in the release and other releases that have come since, of course, that are very interesting. One of my th favorite things wasn't a single feature, but a set of features that taken together support what Java language architect Brian Getz has been talking about as data-oriented programming. Java has worked particularly well in the large sort of monolithic code base. Uh, in this example kind of a code base, you have a lot of code, a lot of classes, you have modularity enforced by the compiler because of the uh, strong privacy and, and compiler controls and access controls that you get with the language. It's well supported by the super fast Java compiler. Uh, and so this kind of kind of a arrangement for a code base has worked particularly well. Usually in these kinds of code bases, the way you expressed a dimension of change was in terms of a new specialization of a type, a new implementation of interface, or a new specialization of an abstract uh, type with an overridden method or two. Uh, and this is how you expressed a new dimension of change to the system. And this has worked well, okay? And, and no, no, nobody's arguing that it has poorly served us. Obviously, we've had 30, almost 30 years of really large code bases and, and successful deployment with Java, so no problem. But increasingly, the code bases that we write today are more of, a, of the nature of a service. They're smaller, they sit in the network responding to data or messages coming in. And increasingly, the d vector by which we express change in a system is no longer the specialized abstract types, but new messages, new data that comes into the system to which we can respond. So the language has to get better to adopt and serve this new sort of use case. And I say new, I'm using air quotes here, but new as in for the last 10, 15 years, right? This, this style of writing code has become very popular. It's no longer the case that we're all in the same JVM and everything you need is there. Now, we have data coming in off the wire, often from uh, the network, from, from REST, from GraphQL, from Kafka, from RabbitMQ, from RSocket, from gRPC, from whatever, right? So it's stringly typed data. And increasingly, the way we express change is in terms of these new messages, right? These stringly typed messages, small, concise, actionless data. They're carriers for data, not for action, right? Uh, and so the language has to support these new kinds of workloads and these new styles of services. And that's what these features do that we're going to look at today. There's four features, sealed types, records, pattern matching, and smart switch expressions that taken together support this incredible like new paradigm, if you will, kind of like object-oriented programming or functional programming. This is data-oriented programming. If I had to sort of categorize it, yeah, I guess I'd say it's like a subset of functional programming with some extra niceties in there for, for a good measure, right? It's a really useful subset of functional programming that lets us describe and work with data as a first class thing in the language. So let's take an example. Let's go see how this works as always by going to my second favorite place on the internet, start.spring.io. And by the way, we're not necessarily using Spring in this video. This is a Java video, but it's just nice to know that you can bootstrap a new project. So again, start.spring.io. All right, here we are at the initializer. Again, all we're gonna do is make sure we've chosen Java 21. Doesn't matter if you're using Maven or Gradle at this point. And let's just call this data-oriented programming, okay? Hit generate, and we'll open this up in our ID. All right, here's a public static void main. Now, let's suppose we work in a highly regulated industry. And in fact, you know, we don't even, this is not even a Spring application, really. We're just using Spring to generate the code project. But let's suppose we worked in a highly regulated industry. Oh, I don't know, finance, let's say, okay? And you've got a type called a loan. Okay, these are these types usually attach to law. There's usually legal consequences for mishandling these kinds of financial instruments. And so you want to make sure that when you write the code that you handle as much as you can, as consistently as you can, right? So let's say I have a loan and the first kind is a secured loan, right? Implements loan. And then we have unsecured loan, which is a different kind of thing altogether. Okay, so we've got two different types. Now again, remember what I said, these things attached to law. There's legal consequences for the mishandling there. So you can imagine each one has a, a validate method or something like that that you want to care for. Suffice it to say, you also want to be very clear about who's handling the implementation and so on, right? So you want to make sure that we're all 
on the same page there. So I've got two different types. I want to limit it to that. So one way I could do this is to make this a sealed type. And what this does is it tells the language that this type will explicitly enumerate its uh, implementations, right? So as to guarantee to the compiler and to yourself what implementations exist out there. So here, we're explicitly enumerating these two types, but they are not yet final, right? If we made them final, that would work, right? Or we could seal them and then pr further permit two other types, but you know, within our explicit knowledge, right? So I could say class no op loan implements loan and, and, and actually we could extend unsecured loan, right? Which, which we don't want, right? So we'd have to make this final like that and then permit this. But again, this is the problem, right? Is that this type is further extended and there's what's to stop somebody from coming in here and sort of doing a no-op implementation of the validation and thus sidestepping all the regulation attached to it. Whatever you do, seal the hierarchy. The easiest way to do this is to make everything final uh, and call it good. A record is a tuple. Other languages have tuples. They are carriers for typed data. So they're untyped carriers for typed data in a particular sequence. So if you wanted to say, carry an int, a string, a boolean, and a date in a particular sequence, you can use a tuple. But Java is a nominal language. Everything in Java has a name. And so our tuple here is called unsecured loan and it has this, this data in it. We describe the data here. We can say that, for example, this unsecured loan has a, an interest rate, okay? But you can put other things, int x, string y, etc. You can just put those, add, add as many of, of those things as you want. These are called components. These are the typed structured data in the untyped record type, okay? These components can be as varied as you want, obviously, you don't have to be just Java Lang types or primitives or whatever. And the contract here is pretty simple. The unsecured loan, the record, has no derived state. It can't store internal data and then and then return that, right? It can't compute and store data in, it, in itself. All it can do is provide methods that derive the state, but it doesn't have its own state. So it's it's a pure type, right? Like, uh, yeah. The data that you put into it is the only data that will ever exist in it, right? And so the, the, the logical consequence of that is that the identity of the record, of, in this case, the unsecured loan, is basically the identity of the uh, components, right? So if I put in a float and I wanna then recreate the same unsecured loan, I don't need to have behind the scenes, uh, behind the curtain sort of knowledge of how to create an unsecured loan, just create it and pass in this interest. Take this value from the old one, pass it into the new one. You have now a new object that is exactly the same semantically as the first one, right? There's no weird copy constructors or anything like that. And, and basically this is pretty nice because the compiler knows about this too. The compiler knows that the identity of unsecured loan is equal to the identity of the components for the unsecured loan. This has some interesting consequences. Basically, it is able to destructure, which is what they call it in other languages, the unsecured loan in terms of the components of the unsecured loan. There's some other benefits here too though. For example, let's say I wanted to serialize this unsecured loan. I could send that unsecured loan over the network, send the object header and do all that kind of stuff, or I could just send the float, right? And the language knows that. And so that's what it does. It's a special case in serialization, starting to, you know, towards a, a more realistic and more sane serialization protocol. If you serialize this unsecured loan, the language will only serialize this float and send up send a little information about the the name of the class to put on the other end of it. It's it's very, very efficient. It doesn't re, it doesn't serialize the whole object. It doesn't need to. It just knows the individual components are the, the uh, part of the object that's interesting. Okay? So it's able to destructure and it knows about how to compose and decompose our, or, you know, our, our object. It knows how to put them back together given the individual parts. We have two implementations of our loan, secured loan and unsecured loan. And we looked at records, right? And records are really nice because they, they are structurally more obvious to the language. One thing that I mentioned here is that we can destructure records. We can't yet do that with classes. There's no way to do that with a regular class. Like the language doesn't know, given a, an arbitrary class, what field it needs to preserve to preserve the state of that class. I get the feeling that this will arrive eventually, right? It's sort of like a, it's, you know, if this is the constructor, right? Then, then the thing that allows it to deserialize itself would be the destructor, right? And I don't know, I get the feeling they're going to work on that or that, that will arrive, but I don't know when, who knows, but I've, I've heard them talk about that being a possibility. Another thing you might notice is that these records have, when you, when you, when you create these records, these records have accessor methods, that is to say, 
there will, there, there will be a method called interest. So USL new unsecured loan and 2.0. Okay, now I can say USL dot interest. So it has an accessor method and it has a valid two string and a valid equals and a valid hash code, all based on the identity of 2.2f, right? So it gets all that for free. So the language does you a lot of favors if you can agree this contract, the, the contract that there is no derived state and that the record is a carrier, essentially, for the component data that you pass in. If you agree that contract, it'll do a lot of cool things for you to give you accessor methods, to string equals hash code, etc. So this is, you know, I think this is really, really nice, just a really nice result. But the problem you, you can imagine is what if you want to change something, right? Like uh, I, I have this unsecured loan here and I choose 2.2f. What if I want to change it? I say, well, I have to create a new one, right? Var new USL, new unsecured loan. And you know, it's not so bad here because I just have one field. So I can just copy the old data over. But imagine I had like 10 fields, you know, that would be very, very tedious, especially if I just want to mutate one field. So one thing that I'm hoping that they'll work on, and again, I've heard sort of an between you and me and the wall, my understanding is that there's an appetite for it, but I haven't seen it yet, uh, is something like with interest, you know? So in this case, you would have a another built-in method that would allow you to take one field, modify it, and then return a clone of the, of the object with that new field changed. And these are called withers, okay? But again, that's not here at the moment, right? But one, one imagines that's gotta be somewhere in the future, right? Okay, so I like records, but let's say I wanted to create a method to display a message for that loan, okay? So imagine we're building the UI, okay? And we want to display a message for the user given a loan. Well, I could, you know, let's say I could do a, a variable. I can say if loan instance of unsecured loan, and then I could say var USL unsecured loan. I could, I could say var USL equals unsecured loan, loan, okay? And then I could say, uh, ouch, that interest rate is going to hurt, right? Very sort of blatantly user, user hostile message, but okay. And then what about if it's a regular loan? If loan, instance of secure loan, var SL. There's nothing really for me to look at in this particular case, but you know, you imagine. Okay, so good job, nice loan, right? So more friendly. And then we turn the message like that. Okay, so we've got now this, this method which it, it works, but it's very ugly. First of all, I'm, I'm doing double work here, right? I'm matching a pattern, but I'm not extracting any value of that match outside of this block, which I'm allowed to be in, but I'm not really, it's doing the work of, of proving that I can cast down to an unsecured loan. Why not let me benefit from that, right? And so you can now with pattern matching. So this is the pattern, this is the extraction, okay? I'm extracting out the results of that pattern into this variable that within the context of this block is definitively castable. So if I look at this USL variable, it is the unsecured loan type. It's not just loan, okay? And you know, it goes even a step further because remember, unsecured loan is a record and the language knows what to do with those types. So I can actually go a step further and extract out just the constituent component, right? The interest. And notice that I didn't need to respecify the, the type. I could just say interest, right? So var interest and it's a float, right? And then within the context of this method, uh, this branch, it is a float that I want to dereference and use, okay? Okay, so very nice. So I'm doing pattern matching, and that's still pretty good, but nothing, it's still not quite there. What happens if I get rid of this? Nothing, nothing, nothing happens, right? That's exactly the pro point, is that we are, nothing is happening, right? We're not getting the benefit of our, of our work here, right? And we're also not guaranteeing, we're, we're not guaranteeing that both cases are handled, because again, this is a financial instrument, highly regulated. It's very important that you capture all cases and you handle and care for all particular cases because otherwise you might, you might fail to handle some validation or some sort of check, right? So we want the compiler to make sure that we're on top of both cases. And it can, remember our loan is a, is a sealed type. The compiler knows exactly how many permutations of a loan there are in the system. It can help us enforce that. It knows how to say whether we've exhausted all the possible checks, just like it can with a, a an enum, right? An enumeration of a particular set of states. So let's take advantage of that by using a smart switch expression. Now this is not just a regular switch. I can't even use a regular switch statement here. I need to use a smart switch expression. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a smart switch expression, which looks like this. First of all, notice that I'm assigning the result of the expression to a variable. That's right. The expression produces ta-da, an expression. Then I'll do some pattern matching in here. I'll match secured loan. Okay. Copy and paste that. And then what about the unsecured loan? Okay. USL. And then same magic, right? I can do this right here. There we go. And take that over there as well. So there's the, the, the much cleaner code. Notice that this is yellow. It's telling me I can just inline that. That's true. No need for the intermediate variable if it does nothing. So now this is, you know, it's, I put new lines there. I'm not even sure if I needed that really. There you go. That's fine. It still technically fits within my a very small width monitor here, right? That's a little bit more than 80, but whatever. Okay, there. Fine. No, leave it back there. Anyway, so we've got this, uh, we've got this handling here. What happens if I comment out one of the branches? The compiler barks. It's saying the switch expression doesn't cover all possible input values. That's true, right? It knows that we have failed to handle one of the two cases. It knows that we haven't exhausted all the permutations of that type, loan, okay? So this is actually more type safe. It's more elegant. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's more clear what's happening or enumerating over this. And the compiler's watching out for it. So it's actually, it's actually a better result. We get better validation, the same results are better much less code, and, and it all just feels like it should be there. So these features, right, data-oriented programming, we looked at sealed types, we looked at records, we looked at the smart switch expression, and we looked at pattern matching. And these things taken together can make your language and make the experience really nice. So now imagine, instead of a loan, you've got data coming in over the network, right? You know, it's nice and easy to describe responses that you get back from REST or GraphQL or or you know grpc or whatever in terms of these types very very elegant very very concise syntax the result here i think is just all around better and i really like it so when you're working with your next web service in spring or uh, something working with kafka or you know grpc or graphql or rsecit or, or or whatever you know consider these techniques right this will make your spring integration code easier it makes working with events in spring modulith easier it makes working with events in Spring Framework and in Spring Integration, easier. It makes working with messages in the Kafka support and the MQP support and, and uh, JMS support and whatever, easier. This is just a very nice addition to language that makes our processing code cleaner and nicer. And, and suddenly, even things like ye old application listener, right? If you implement application listener, you know, the old pattern used to be that it, it would, before generics, application listener took a parameter of type object. Now you can implement application listener and give it a parameterized bound and you could give it a sealed type as your bound and then in the same method without having to have duplicative methods and all that and duplicate duplicative listeners you can just switch on the types if it's sealed and and, and handle both of them very nicely here in, in addition this kind of support this is the kind of support that makes typed messages in you know actor frameworks like akka so convenient if you're using cqrs frameworks like uh, axon you're also going to care about the ability to easily switch on uh, different types here. Remember, a switch expression, if you look at the bytecode, is actually faster. It's it's much faster than sometimes because it's constant time than, for example, a polymorphic if-else, right? Because the if-else is potentially unbounded and it has to do a v-table sort of crawl, right? Here, a switch works because it's jumps, right? It's an opcode that lets you go to a particular offset based on each value. So this is actually faster code in most of the cases as well as more efficient and more elegant. It's just a good result. It's a very, very good result. So I hope you'll uh, take a look at these amazing features and see if you can use them in your next application. Thanks everybody, as always, for watching and I'll see you next week.